Today on the podcast, I welcome Mr. Darius Evans. A longtime resident of Georgia, Darius Evans is a film and television producer, an instructor in the art of production, and a leader in the Georgia production industry. He currently serves as a new co-president of Georgia Production Partners, or GPP, as it's known within Georgia. GPP is the single largest film TV production membership group in the state, and as production has skyrocketed in the last 15 years, so have the demands on GPP. Covering new territory and supporting the creative community through the pandemic, GPP has become an important hub for people to network, seek advice, attend events, and get the latest information on what's happening in the film business. In 2022, the film industry alone brought in $4.4 billion in spending from production companies, a record year and a sign of things to come. Offering scholarships, production and writing clinics, news and information, Darius Evans at the helm of GPP is, well, a busy guy. We'll talk tax incentives, member demands, money, resources, and more. Let's welcome Darius Evans. Darius, welcome. Ryan, it's a pleasure, man. Thank you for having me. How you been? I've been good. I've been good. We haven't seen each other for a couple couple weeks, but everything's been good. It's been really good. What Great are you stuff. working on here in Atlanta? So uh, quite a few things, man. You wouldn't believe it if I told you, but uh, my main project that I'm working on now is actually a film project through my production company um, that we just started, physical production company called Continue Entertainment. And uh, we have this film project that I've been developing now for about a year. Uh, It's a reality based period piece based in the late 60s, early uh, late 50s, early 60s, based out of Florida. It's called The Highway Men. It's about this group of black uh, artists, landscape artists that were painting these beautiful landscapes uh, of the Georgia waterlands. And uh, because of the times, they were in the Jim Crow times. And so uh, they weren't able to get any representation. They weren't able to get into any galleries. And so they decided that they would sell these paintings uh, door to door. And they just went up and down Highway 95 uh, North and South and A1A. And they sold these paintings door to door for about twenty five dollars each. And they got so good at it, they developed this process where they were actually mass producing these paintings by hand uh, by thousands a week. It was a group of 25 artists. And um, uh, fast forward to mid 90s, they got recognized by the uh, Florida Artist Hall of Fame. And now they're painting, those same paintings are going for $35,000, $40,000 each. Come on. And um, super famous group down there. They're out of Fort Pierce, Florida. And um, we found the story. Actually, the story found me. And I uh, got engrossed in the story. Went down to Fort Pierce in Orlando and visited some of the collectors of the artwork. I visited some of the remaining artists and their families and just got engrossed in the story. It's just such a beautiful story of, of um, uh, the American dream. You know, this group had this dream of being rich and owning Cadillacs and they achieved both. Um, and But it's a story of some heartbreak and heartache, of course, because of the times. And, and uh, it's just an amazing story, man. And I'm excited to be doing it. And we are in prep now or we're in development now. Uh, we'll be in prep by uh, March. Yes. When, when you say Highway 95 and A1A, you're talking about down like the panhandle of Florida? Yep. Up and down Florida highways. Yep. And that's why they call them the highway, man. And they were painting the lake they were painting these lakes, the oceans, just these waterways. All the beautiful uh, content down there in the panhandle. Amazing colors, amazing use of color, amazing use of imagery. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you see these paintings, um, you know, if you like landscape uh, art, then you know these these paintings are amazing. And just the fact that they were done at, at such a mass level, mm-hmm. they would have these huge painting parties in backyards, uh, the backyards of the artists. And they would just, every artist would paint one part of the painting. So someone would be responsible for the clouds. Someone would be responsible for the water. Someone would be responsible for the birds. And, um, and so they just had this like assembly line of making specialists. They They were specialists Mm -hmm. and, and, and they used just crude materials. Like they would use gypsum board from old houses and they would use, you know, the frames would be the old, window frames and door frames from these homes. And um, they put these things together and sometimes they pack them in the back of their car, still wet. 
and they drive them up and down highways and they would sell them to individuals, hotels, car dealerships, all kinds of folks. And, um, and because of, I guess the cost of them at that time, they were like 20, 25 bucks. People didn't have a lot of, uh, they didn't show a lot of value for them. And so they would end up at garage sales. They'd end up in the trash heaps and stuff like that. And so finding those pieces now, I mean, you can just imagine. And that's why they're going for so much. You can just imagine how, uh, you know, eclectic the the collection would be if you collected Highwaymen project, uh, projects. Yeah. So, so a lot of these were destroyed. That's why they're scarce today. Exactly. Mm. The vast majority of them were destroyed. Yep. So they, it makes sense to me now when you start to talk about them selling to hotels, car dealerships. I mean, they were mm -hmm. they were they were selling commercial art pieces that could kind of take up space. And if they're doing landscapes, yep. then it's just about like having something that's pleasant. Just having something on the walls. And what I love down there, I mean, I don't know, you know, how many people that are listening have ever been to 30A or like all of the 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 uh, the panhandle of Florida. Mm -hmm. The landscapes are gorgeous. It's amazing. Just these just the vivid sunsets, the mm -hmm. colors of the the wildlife even. I mean, it's just an amazing place to be, that Panhandle area of Florida. And so this movie, is it just telling the story? Like, is it starting from the beginning of making the paintings and then growing into? It centers around one individual. Uh, his name is Alfred Hare. Um, and he was the catalyst uh, behind the movement. It's actually called now the last American art movement, uh, the highwaymen movement. And so the story kind of centers around Alfred and uh, from high school when he got first inspired um, by his art teacher to take up art and take up painting and his training process and then him convincing his friends and buddies to get into it, teaching them. You know, they were guys just on the street doing things that street guys would do. And um, he just kind of convinced them that, hey, you come with me and we can make a whole lot of money doing these paintings. And some of them were resistant, resistant, but they came along with them anyway. And um, they ended up being super successful. They were like making what you would call drug money now, just off of paintings, painting, send, selling these paintings, two, three hundred of them a week each. Two, uh, three hundred each. Each. It's incredible when you think, so, well, 25 bucks, I mean, back then was at least 10 times, yeah. right, right? At least. So 250 bucks for a painting Yep. and you're cranking them out and you're selling, I mean, it's a lot of money. Yep. And they're selling them in out cash, of your, in cash, out of the trunk of the car. Mm -hmm. And when you go to Fort Pierce now, you know, there's a museum for the highway men. There are uh, statues and all kinds of just reminiscent things of them uh, in the city. They're the pride of the city. Uh, they're the pride of the county. They're the pride of the area. And it's just such an unknown story. And it's as much a story about the resilience of uh, these people. There's There was one uh, female highwayman. And so we focus on her quite a bit in the, in the script. And so, you know, it's just these stories of these individuals and how they came together and, you know, some tragedies happen in the, in the course of the story in real life, you know? And so, um, you know, we're just hoping to sell, to, to tell a beautiful story through not just art, but also through the music mm. and, um, through the lives of these people, like music is going to play such a huge role, um, in this piece. And, uh, hopefully, you know, everybody else will see it the way that we see it. You know, when you hear about the story, you just fall in love with it. I, I've fallen in love with it. What, you're getting ready to start physical production. Is that what you said? We're, uh, we're in development now. We're about to start, um, prep. And okay. then we hopefully we'll be in pre in, in physical production by June. By uh, June. June. Yeah. Okay. And right now, is it independent or do you have? It's independent. It's independent. totally independent. Yep. Totally independent. We have some pretty good uh, A-listers that we're involving in the project, though. And um, some folks who have the script now who are interested in coming on board. So we got a great package for the for the project. And um yeah, it's totally independent. But script is written. Script is written. So the project has been in various phases of production for the last 12 years. Hmm. Um, I just got hired on myself back in March of last year. And so I've been working hard at it for the last uh eight or nine months just trying to get the thing packaged and clean up some things that needed to be cleaned up with the business of the film and uh, getting it to a place where we're ready to get get going on it. 
It's incredible. Yeah. How many of the, are there any names that you can announce yet? No, not no. that I can announce yeah, yet. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But you do have some people attached. Oh, yeah. And you're just trying to fill out the rest of the cast. Exactly. And then yeah. you'll try to finalize a budget. Yeah, so we have a uh, director, we have um, uh, editors attached. You know, most of our keys we already have attached. And, of course, uh, me and my partner, Rob Jackson, who I uh, got to send a shout out to Rob. He's uh, just off of his second Emmy. When uh, he's my business partner at Continue Entertainment, and so, um, yeah, he, we're we're on board and we're making a move. We're making it happen. Love that. Yeah. What what, is, what was the last thing you guys made before this? So um, it's it's a lot, man. It's been a lot. We just started Continue though uh, in December. Oh, this is new, a new venture. It's a brand new venture. Um, so I'd been working on this High Women project, like I said, since March um, as an independent producer. Mm -hmm. And Rob had been in L.A. working for the Spring Hill Company, for Le LeBron James yeah. Company, mm -hmm. producing TV. And so I'd been doing a lot of indie producing myself and he'd been doing a lot of uh, network producing. And so we just decided when he moved back to Atlanta that we would get connected. We had been connected on uh, many projects in the past, just as him, him as a writer and producer and myself as a producer. And so we just decided we'd do this together and do physical production. So how much development will you guys do versus how much like on set management production. Yeah. So right now we're looking at doing probably 50, 50, cause I focus more on the development side on the, on the film uh, and independent film development side. And he focuses more on the, the television and network side and the physical production. And so, you know, of course we cross paths on all projects that we take on, but for the most part, it's probably going to be about 50, 50 for us. So when the high windman goes to production, he'll be there every day, you know, manage all the logistics You'll show up and do yep. some of that, but yep. it, but more you're filling a pipeline. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. For the most part, I'll be probably on to the next development project, um, developing another project or something. We got a couple on the slate right now that are really, really exciting to us. Um, and we want to create these stories um, that are just impactful stories, um, American stories, mm -hmm. stories about the American dream, story about stories about, you know, people making it against all odds. And those are the type of projects that we are looking for and that we take on. And so we've been lucky. We have a really good slate of um, projects that we're looking at um, from the development side and that we're hoping to uh, to get into for the rest of the year, we have about 10 projects that we are in various phases of development on already because he brought a bunch to the table. I brought a bunch to the table. So, you know, we're just trying to work through what comes first, what comes next. Mm -hmm. Well, when we, offline, let's discuss a little bit more al along that, because um, there's some really cool things coming together in Georgia around. I'd say it's kind of core development guys mm -hmm. who understand how to develop stuff from scratch. Yep. Um, LA guys that okay. have all relocated here. Okay. That are all uh, starting to band together and okay. create um, not just development pipelines, but also financing pipelines to start yeah. bringing in other independents like what you're doing and yep. saying, all right, well, let's, let's, let's plug that in to this Absolutely. system. Right? And, and then you know, we're, that's we're tied we into distribution, right? And so those are all the things yeah. we need yeah. to <laughs> actually create a, uh, I always say we have a great production industry here in the state of Georgia. We don't really have a film industry. We don't now. We have a production industry. Yeah, because we're not uh, we're not originating projects. We're not packaging projects here, financing them, and then distribution is missing as well. And so those are the the pieces, those last pieces to the puzzle that will really establish us as a great film production hub. Well, when you walked in, um, I was on the phone with a guy in LA who mm -hmm. is a, a lawyer for a writer in LA, mm -hmm. uh, talking through what, um, a deal might look like okay. to have this writer get started on a, on a production. Now that production would be a television show. Okay. And, and he would write a pilot yep. and, and, you know, just create the baseline for this. Yep. And we just pay him WGA, uh, rates. Yep. And we have to, we're, we have to create a WGA entity, but all this stuff is kind of new mm -hmm. 
for Georgia. It is. It is. There's very few uh, writers rooms here, especially, you know, even on an independent level, there's very few writers rooms, although there are a ton of writers. You know, I know plenty of writers from different genres and do different styles. Um, but we just I think there's a lack of knowledge here in the state, too, of how to put those things together and how to package those deals. And I've met with quite a few of the producers that have come here from uh, from L.A. and other places. And, you know, they're bringing that knowledge and know how here. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to build an actual industry here because we need it. People like you need it. I mean, you guys, uh, you guys have come up over the last 10 years and have given us the ability to produce here. And the uh, the basis of uh, of an infrastructure, and now we can start to build an actual industry around that infrastructure. Yeah, it's uh, the, the the main thing that's going to build that is capital. One hundred percent, absolutely. So as we continue to have more capital that will play in the space, because yep. yeah, most Georgia money has never made money in production. That's right, right? Never made money in uh, creating content. Yep. And so we have to. It's like all things you have to give money and experience of making money yeah, to then attract more money because the money that, that went in the first time will say, Hey, we did it the first time. Yep. It worked out great. Here's kind of the process, right? And they start to understand the process and it doesn't feel so foreign. It doesn't feel like such a magical box, like a disappearing, you know, like you just disappear behind the curtain and then just appear back with, you know, a script right. or whatever, the, or a program that works. They start to understand the evolution from idea to scripting yep. to packaging, which is, you know, attaching um, talent, yep. whether it's directorial talent or uh, acting talent. Cinema, cinematography, uh, you know, getting a cinematographer to join on just like the entire slate of yep. talent that needs to be attached to a film to where then you can finalize the budget, right? Because yep. you don't know the final budget until you know who's going to be in it. Yep. And how right? much they're going to charge. And how much they're going to charge you. So right. now, now once you have a final budget, you can then try to go to financing. Yep. Right. And so all of that evolution is something that money in the South has to learn. That's right. And we got to remember, too, that L.A. has a hundred year head start on us. And so, you know, this is generational investing that's happening over there. This is first generation here in Georgia. And so, yeah, there's a huge learning curve. Um, and when you're dealing with other people's money, that learning curve is, is important. But I think that, you know, as long as we're building um, from scratch, as long as we continue to move forward with it, uh, we'll get there. You know, we got some time. We got some time. We'll get there. We'll get there. I think about how far we've come since 2008. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right when the tax credit first passed. Yep. From 2008 to 2014, you know, very little happened. That's right. And then Dan Cathy opened Pinewood. Yep. Which is today called Trillith. Yep. But in 2014, it was called Pinewood, and that changed everything. It did. It did. And, and I think that we don't recognize that enough, right, in terms of um, what happened in the history of this tax incentive. So I am now, I'm the new, newly installed, newly elected co-president of GPP. And one of the first things that I've had to do was learn the history of not just the organization, but the history of where the film industry here in the state. And so looking at what, to your point, what happened in 2014 with, with Pinewood Studios and how that has opened up things. And I work there now. Um, I teach down there and uh, it's amazing what they're doing down at Trillith. I mean, ex try to explain to people who've never been there what's happened at Trillith. Oh, man. So, yeah, it started out as just a production space. You know, you know they, have, they had a bunch of um, uh, sound stages, but they I can't even tell you how many acres of land that they came up on down there. But I think they started with 700, 700 acres of land. And uh, so, yeah, they built out these sound stages, this beautiful studio as Pinewood back then. And they just had this um, this plan, this long term plan of what they would do with those 700 acres and for the whole entire area. And they built not just more and more soundstage space, but they also have a, a place called the town at Trillith which is a live workspace, um, a ton of um, housing. They have everything from tiny houses up to mega mansions in that one little space. And then all of the shopping and, and food that you want to have in the space. Um, and so I think that probably sits on, you know, 40 or 50 acres 
over there. And um, there's a hospital on the, on the uh, small, very small hospital on the land, as well as, you know, in the future, they have so many plans. I don't even know all the plans that they have for the future. I do know that there's some sort of a um, soccer training facility for I think the, the U.S. soccer training facility was just announced that it was moving from Chicago to Trillith. To Trillith. Yeah. And the impact that this place has had on not just the entire state, but very specifically um, Fayetteville, Georgia, has been amazing. I mean, who would have thunk, you know, 15, 20 years ago that this space that was just all woods, all sticks, all stones, that today would be just sort of this mini metropolis. It's amazing down there. Yeah, it's a world unto itself. It's like a, it's like this little creative island. Yeah, you know, I talked to a couple people, you know, conspiracy theorists and others. They tell, they say that uh, that'll probably be the first place in the U.S. that'll have its own little bubble over it. So, <laughs> so you know, places like Trilla, they'll have that little bubble because um, it already is sort of a, a bubble, right? So when we were coming out of the pandemic, I think that was one of the first places outside of Tyler Perry Studios that were um, able to open back up out of the pandemic because it is so secluded and people are able to, you know, kind of be in this area by themselves. And so, yeah, I, I just love Trillis. I love being down there. I love working there. Well, let's live, work, play. Do you live down there or do you just drive down no, there? No, I just drive down there. I live in Mableton, which okay. we got a lot of work to do there. But um, no, I, I, I wish I lived. I wish I had the vision back, you know, and 20 years ago when I moved to Atlanta to move down in that area. I mean, how would you know? Right. I mean, it, that, that, that is something that only is born from a, you know, a billionaire's imagination yeah. and, and willingness to take risk. Absolutely. Right. I mean, that, that is 100% born and raised Dan Cathy. Yep. Saw the vision very early. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. early. It is an incredible place. I've got a number of friends who are uh, who go down there often. They have offices both in Buckhead and mm -hmm. down at Trillith. And um, it's becoming an, an incredible uh, center of creativity. Yeah. Uh, in that there's just a lot of conversations happening around development. There's a lot of yep. conversations happening around capital. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly there's lots of content being made at Trillith. But mm -hmm. as you know, when you're making content, you don't really have time just to hang out right. and brainstorm. You don't have time to develop things. Right. You're working investment banking hours yep. to try to get a, con a piece of content from now zero to finished. Mm -hmm. And that project is on a project timeline. Mm -hmm. And if you fall behind, you better catch up. That's right. And so the guys that are actually down there making content, they just don't have a lot of free time to you know, it's 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 really physical production. You know, the the development of the content is happening elsewhere. And this is with most most studios, as you know, uh, the development is happening in L.A. or New York or, or elsewhere. And then they just come here to shoot. And that's all that's there at this point. You know, you have workers there. You have uh, executives there that are on the uh, physical production side. But it's it's pretty much all physical production. I know that uh, the Kathy family, they're talking about getting into production and development. Um, I've heard some conversations have been had about um, them getting into actually producing content, but you know, no, they are, they yeah, are, that's already happening. Okay. Right. So uh, Frank Patterson, I know is really leading that charge. Okay. You know, know for, um, for them to continue to develop pipelines of content and they've been working on that for years and they, mm -hmm. and they keep getting closer and closer to uh, full blown um, production development companies. Okay. So they're, they're, they're way down the road. They, they've got, um, money allocated for it. Yeah. Uh, they've got, um, uh, talent out looking, you know, for new content. Yeah. They've got, um, development producers trying to package things. So there you go. That's that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. They're building that down there. So that's, that's very cool. Yeah. So that, that kind of dynamism is, is on the streets yeah. of Trillith. Cool. That's very cool. I love that place. Yeah. So you're also teaching in South Africa. Is that right? Yeah. So um, I had this idea about two years ago that I wanted to uh, teach uh, film production techniques somewhere on, on the, the uh, continent. And so I developed this program called the Pan-African Film and Television Academy. And so I just started this year. 
this month um, working with some partners out there in South Africa to start bringing the initial. Uh, actually, I started last year working with some folks in Nigeria to bring the physical buildings and the physical schools um, to Nigeria, but working in South Africa to do the virtual school. So um, I started this month teaching virtual um, production classes uh, in South Africa. So uh, what's today? Tomorrow is my next class. And so I just teach production techniques from a producer standpoint, as far as developing your script, you know, packaging your project and those type of things. You know, there's plenty of resources out there for learning what camera to use, what kind of microphones to use, the best lights to use. But um, what we do is one of those things that you really, you learn by your trial by fire, right? But I can help to give you sort of the baseline of where to look, where to start and um, how to put these projects together. And so um, I thought about a lot of people here in the U.S. are like, well, you should teach that here. And I'm like, yeah, well, but you know, there's enough of, of, of resources here. Um, I wanted to start over there and just start to develop um, just a really high quality style of producing as much as I can over there. Why South Africa and not Nigeria? Because Nigeria does so much content. Yeah. So, so Nigeria is on the list, of course, Nigeria, um, Egypt, I should be going over to Egypt in the next month or so to talk to them a little bit more about the program. Um, and actually is my contact, my partner in, um, Nigeria is bringing me to, to Egypt to, you know, get with the funding and all that stuff. And so, um, definitely Nigeria. I've been working in Nigeria now for probably the last 13 years um, on different projects for Nigerian TV and film projects. And so, um, yeah, I'm definitely bring, I'm bringing the physical uh, school to Nigeria. Tell me so more about the Nigerian ecosystem, because I don't know a lot about it. I know huge amounts of content come out of Nigeria. Yeah. But are there big soundstage complexes? You know, no, no. Yeah, tell me, tell me about no, the ecosystem. It's, it's all running gun over there, man. It's, you know, at the largest level. So I worked on a project over there that was probably, I think we figured that it was the second largest budget out of uh, Lagos and it was $250,000. Come on. <laughs> what can you make for $250,000? It came out to be a beautiful project. It was amazing. It was a great project. Um, it's in post now, but it's you couldn't do post in America. You can couldn't do post for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> but um, but no, I, I I think that so to answer your question, the industry there is really what we would think is sort of primitive, right? So they get the equipment a little bit later. The process, though, they've been around forever, right? And Nollywood has been around forever, and so there's they have their processes that they're already ingrained in. And so the the idea of bringing them sort of to the 22nd, 21st century, um, that's been sort of the challenge. So Nigeria actually has um, sort of two-sided community. It's the old Nollywood and new Nollywood. So this new Nollywood, you know, they, they the old Nollywood, they're more sort of, sort of the traditional ways of shooting and and the traditional ways of putting together projects in this new Nollywood is very similar to new Hollywood, right? Let's just run and gun. Let's just go. We got these cameras and we we got this idea. Let's go. And so what I'm really trying to do, um, and I know, you know, I'm trying to make as much of an impact as I can just kind of bring sort of a more um, thoughtful way of producing film. And, it, you, you know, they can produce 15, one producer can produce 15 films in a month in, in, in Nigeria, 10, 15 films a month. Um, and because their budgets are so low and they're just running and gunning, there's no process of needing to get, you know, any kind of uh, permission to shoot in places and stuff like that permits. Mm. And so, so yeah. So, so, so the government's pretty lax when it comes to filming. There's like, you run and gun yeah. and we're cool. No, they're not, they're not trying to do this on the, on the side. No, no, it's, 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 yeah, you can actually, in some places you can shoot on other people's comp, comp, uh, property without any permission, no permits or anything. You just say, hey, set up your camera over there and shoot what you got to shoot. And when you're done, you keep it moving. 
So there's no extras. They just they just like live with who's ever on the street. More, than, more than <laughs> like, you know, they hire their their main cast, of course, and then yeah, sometimes it depends. Like, you know, a lot of times, two hundred fifty uh, grand, like you better you're gonna live with the environment. Yeah, a lot of times they use. You know, obviously they have um, the tribal system over there uh, in Nigeria, and so for our uh, project that I worked on, it was, it's called the Osu Cast. Is the name of the film Osu Cast C A S T E. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's about this this uh, couple that were from different tribes that were forbidden to marry. And so they decided, you know, they fell in love and they decided to get married. And the story goes about or goes on about, you know, their relationship and how they developed that relationship. But um, so a lot of the people from the tribes end up being extras and being, you know, the crew and stuff like that. And so it really depends on where you're shooting. Yeah, so it's really interesting. It's it's actually fascinating to shoot over there because it is so different. How do you make any money over there? You don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't. You really don't because, you know, when I first started working over there, we still had DVDs and stuff and uh, bootlegging was so rampant over there. You couldn't make any money. Um, these days, of course, it's a little bit different, but there's, there's still bootlegging. And so a lot of movies, you can get them in the uh, theaters. They have uh, theater chains over there and you get films in, in theaters and you can make some money that way. But any secondary markets, you can forget about it. It's, it's bootleg all the way. How, how are the people who are making the films making any money? Like, I guess, what's the what's the capital world over there? Who's funding this stuff? How are they getting returns? Why are they doing it again? Because they're doing it again and again and again. I mean, oh, Nollywood, yeah. the amount of content by hour is astronomical. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. Like, how are they making their money? A lot of it is through, um, they do still have home sales, you know, no more, you know, not as well. They still do actually do a lot of uh, DVD sales over there and some streaming as well. So there are avenues for revenue, but um, obviously it's not as developed as maybe here. But do you, is there like a, a Netflix equivalent? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. It, and, and maybe they're funding it or? Yes, some. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like here, right? Netflix doesn't fund everything. But a big thing that's happened over there that I actually was wor- working on a couple of years ago is mobile. So mobile is huge. Everybody has a cell phone and they do a lot through cell phone. They access the Internet. They access all of their entertainment and not just, you know, I guess we do the same, but they're they take it to another level. And so um, uh, like they might not have a television. They, they may not have tele- everything on right, their phone. Right. They don't have a television. They don't have a telephone everything is cell phone Mm -hmm. and so being able to deliver content to the cell phone has been a big thing for years there and um, at least 10 years and so the telephone companies which um there's three mtn vodafone and there's one more but they've actually been um doing a lot of investing and content, Mm -hmm. you know, if you have content done, um, I actually did a deal years ago where I sold a ton of shorts to, uh, MTN because they were developing, that's when they were developing this network of distribution of, uh, of content to, uh, cell phones. And I sold them a bunch of us based uh, content, um, for MTN. So some of that money comes from that kind of stuff, just creative deal making. Yeah. There, I I would love, that'd be a fascinating study. Who's funding all this content and, and how is it rotating through over and over such that it's coming back? Yeah, it, no, it's, it's, yeah. Cause you know, there's a huge independent, um, every, just about same everybody. in the U S but the problem is the majority of independent movies don't make money. Right. Even in the U S even the U S right. Right. Cause they don't have a home. They don't have distribution. Yep. And so oftentimes they lack the ability to even try to make money. That's right. I see it every day. I see it all the time with these smaller projects here that they have no idea about distribution. They just want to make a movie. And I think that happens a lot over there. They just want to make a movie. They find the money wherever they find it. It's a lot less money that they find. Mm -hmm. But every dollar is a lot to them. And so for them to raise that that money and, and some of it has to do with, um, you know, just kind of hand to hand, person to person sales, you know, getting somebody to buy access to your film. 
for 20 bucks or 15 bucks uh, Naira over there. So what did you do during the strike? I was very busy, <laughs> very busy doing a strike, especially with GPP. Um, you know, it's like a full time job for me. It's it's a volunteer position as co-president. But I was vice president last year during the strike. And uh, we really focus on we focused then we focused on um, advocacy for the workers. Uh, we supported sag after very closely. Uh, we partnered with them on all kinds of things, making sure that people had resources that they need during the strike, both uh, WGA and sag after. Um, we have um, probably we're probably the largest membership organization in this industry across the state, right? And we do stretch across the, st the state. And so when you, you have this baby industry here and, and we're going through things like the pandemic back to back with dual strikes, you know, it hurts the industry quite a bit. And so we just tried to be there and be um, uh, advocates for the workers, we try to, to disseminate as much information as we could about the strikes and about, you know, opportunities for them to get help as they needed it. And, um, you know, it was it was a full time job. I never slowed down. What did you think about the resolution? So I'm not a member, obviously, of sag After or WGA. And so I have to be careful of what <laughs> of how I say these things. But, uh, you know. If they're happy, I'm happy, you know, and you can't please everybody. Right. So everybody sure. has their own um, real and conceived needs. And you just can't with one contract meet all of those needs. And there's going to be some people in any negotiation that's not going to be happy. And uh, my main thing during the strike was I felt for the people who were affected by it financially and otherwise, you know, even creatively affected by it. And, uh, you know, we just needed to have some sort of a re resolution that is workable, may not be perfect. It's only what, three years. Um, mm -hmm. we'll be back at the table of our, our actually we'll be back at the table this year with, uh, the Teamsters and with, um, IATSE. And mm -hmm. so hopefully that'll go better because it's not just, the members of these unions and guilds that are affected is the entire industry. And people were suffering last year because of these strikes um, financially and otherwise. And so I was happy about the resolution because of that, because we were able to kind of alleviate some of the suffering. And of course, you know, everybody didn't get what they want, but everybody got back to work. Well, they say in the best negotiations, everybody's a little unhappy. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's how you know it's a good, good, a good negotiation. Everybody wasn't happy. Yeah. How's it coming out of the strike? Like, what what are you seeing in the industry here? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 interesting. Um, it's interesting because it's sort of a, a slow start, a slow sputter. Um, people are kind of finding their way. There's projects that got put on hold last year that they have to come back to, um, and. Some have to recast it. Some have to repackage these deals because of the time that went past. And um, so it's it's sort of a slow comeback, but I'm seeing the money is starting to flow. People are getting their projects um, financed. Um, those projects that were put on hold, they're getting their finance back to financing back. And so they're getting back to work on those. Uh, I think everybody was just sort of so anxious to get back to work um, by the end of last year that um, and, and just the industry just had to catch up to um, we have a lot of catching up to do for the upcoming seasons. Right. So TV has been um, and, and film has been affected greatly because it's a shortage of content. And when you watch some of the streamers now, you see a lot of foreign content, whether it's from the UK or from uh, Asia or from Africa. And um that's because, you know, there's going to you'll see more and more over the next couple of months because there has been a shortage of of content and, and we got a lot of work to do. And so I think in the next in the coming months, we're just going to see so much activity with people just trying to get caught up and get these projects in the pipeline for hopefully fall stuff will start, you know, picking back up in terms of the viewing. So other than the highwaymen, what else? Uh, what other cool stuff do you have in the pipe that you can talk about? 
other than highway men and, and doing continuity entertainment, um, and, and the physical production, that's going to keep me super busy for the next foreseeable future and trying to really, um, make a difference in this position with GPP, you know what I'm saying? Making a difference across the state, um, with the people, Mm -hmm. um, our membership and, and beyond our membership, just trying to make an impact across the state to make sure that we are protecting this tax incentive. Yeah. What do you think is going on there? What what the, what are the conversations you're hearing? And well, you know, they're in session now. Mm -hmm. So this is an extremely important time for people to be paying attention to those conversations was coming out of session right now. I haven't heard anything negative come from, um, from being in session, but we're still sort of early in the process. And so, you know, we're, we're just waiting and ready. And what, what we do is um, obviously we have our lobbyists up there. Um, Louis Massey, who's up there, who's lobbying every day for the incentive making sure, and he's keeping us abreast on those conversations that are coming, um, coming out. So there's been a tax on tax incentives across the board, right? Not just the film incentive. And so uh, we just have to kind of wait and see what happens and react um, while being proactive at the same time uh, in, the, in, in the sense of we're trying to make sure that these legislators are uh, abreast of the impact that this incentive has on the everyday people of, of the state and their constituents. Right. And making sure that they understand that uh, it's not just, you know, for Hollywood people who move to Atlanta or move to Georgia who are benefiting from this incentive, which is some, for some it's the, um, it's what they think, but for, but the reality is that almost everyone in the state, no matter what you do, you're going to be touched by this industry in one way or another, especially if you own a business. Well, one of the things that I think we keep searching for is an economist who might actually understand at a deeper level the impact of the credits. Yeah. I think the economists in the UK and Canada mm-hmm. understand it a little bit better. But it is difficult as a as a state that doesn't um it's not a sovereign country. Right. We don't print our own money. Um the state tax credit in Georgia is all driven around a 6% income tax or six and a half percent income tax. Whereas the, the credits in the UK are based on basically like a 50% national tax. So there's a lot more people that need those credits. Yeah. Um, they get stretched out and used a lot faster, Mm -hmm. right. At 50% than six and a half percent. Um, same in Canada, Mm -hmm. right. Same, same thing. So, um, additionally, when you're, giving out tax credits uh, as the UK or Canada, but then every person that comes to work there pays you 50% tax. Right. What do you care if you're giving back a 30% tax credit? Right. You're making money. Yeah. Right. And so it is easy. They have better math than we have in Georgia as a state. Yeah. And and I think you're right. It's important that we get people who are non-political, who don't have, uh, you know, a dog in this fight that's truly independent to come in and do a true evaluation of the economic impact. We've Mm -hmm. had it done before. We actually have a white paper that we worked with um, Georgia State and CMII to put out last year about the economic impact. Um, And then there's other uh, counter white papers that have come out as well. But, uh, you know, having that independent look at the real dollar for dollar impact of having a tax incentive like this, um, I think it come, you'd see, you know, a very positive out, outcome. We can see it every day with our members, the, the, you know, just the impact of having a job that pays, if not six figures, close to six figures at the most bottom level. You know, those type of industries just don't exist anywhere else, Mm -hmm. you know, where you can just come out of, you don't even have to come out of college, just get the right training and you can get a start in this industry and make, you know, close to six figures, if not more than six figures. Where where does that happen? The tax credit here is coming up on 16 years old. Yeah. So we're four years away from 20 years of tax credit. Yep. In 2008, I believe we were making about $50 million a year plus or minus of content in Georgia. Mm -hmm. 
Last year, I believe it was like four point four billion. billion. Yep, Isn't that amazing. That's amazing. It's crazy. What What do you? What, what's kind of your hope? What do you What do you hope that happens over the next four years? Right until we get to like the twenty year mark. Yeah, and then what are you imagining beyond that? Like, what do you? What What's your hope? Uh, let's go out a decade, like a decade from now. We're sitting here in twenty thirty four in Georgia. Yep. What's your, what is the, what does the entertainment industry look like here? It goes back to our earlier conversations, right? I, I hope to see our industry to be more self-reliant, less relying on LA productions or New York productions to come here and fill these millions and millions of square feet of stage space. Um, that's a lot of space and it's not a matter of whether or not Hollywood's going to pull out is a matter of when. Right. And so we have to start to build our uh, effort, not build infrastructure, but build our industry from scratch here with our smaller independent producers. You know, Tyler Perry started as an independent producer. Will Packer started as, as an independent producer. We need to start to develop more independent producers who can take up that space when the time comes that is needed, because we want, you know, we we want to make sure that um, builders and owners like yourself who own these these studios and these stage spaces, they can thrive forever, whether or not Hollywood decides to shoot here or in Tennessee or South Africa, or wherever they're going to go next. Uh, we really need to be able to build an industry here um, if we want to sustain it for the next hundred years, not going beyond four years or or. 15 years for the next hundred years, we have to be able to develop our projects here. We have to be able to originate financing here. We have to be able to have creatives and writers here that are able to create these ideas and these projects. And we need to support them. We need to start supporting them now um, before it's too late because we can't depend on someone else's money forever. Mm -hmm. We have to start originating our own at some point and there's no better time than now. Well, it's interesting to do some of that math. So in order to, to produce 4.4 billion yeah. um, in the state, the state has to issue tax credits yeah. around like 1.4 billion. 30%. Right. Mm -hmm. And the question, some of the question becomes, sh should some of that money flow to making content that's, that's local, you know, that, that is helping to build up the finance infrastructure of the state, good development money, you know? Yeah, that's what you do in Canada, actually. Right. Yeah, it works perfectly. You know, I know plenty of people who get grants from the Canadian government to produce projects in the UK as well. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they do grants for projects and yeah, that, that would actually make sense. So maybe that's something the GPP could take up with the state where you start to say, all right, well, let's, let's do this. Um, we're going to keep the 30% tax credit, mm -hmm. but we're only going to allocate 27%, 26%, 25%. Right. Mm -hmm. And then that other percentage, we're going to keep it, but it's all going to flow into a grant bucket, mm. a production grant bucket. Yep. Right. Where now we start to have some other money that isn't just to reimburse people for already making stuff, but now we got some money that can flow to yeah to build an actual industry. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Something to think about. It is. It GPP really is. Was. Great idea. Yeah. One of the one of the things that um, that I tried to help get started, and you know, and um, Dolores Crowell runs uh, the Georgia Film Foundation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And the idea behind the Film Foundation was how do you start to layer in all of uh, the kids and education from mm -hmm. the youngest age possible mm -hmm. to where they can start to understand this industry. Yep. Right. And, um, and the, and the, the idea was that at some point you get the production company. So if they're getting a billion four back in tax credits mm -hmm. that you say carve out 20 million yep. a year 
to flow into this foundation that can just then target education in the state of Georgia around film and television, just build out these film rooms, build out these production hubs so that kids get touches. Yeah, no, there's a couple of organizations and I think there may be one that are looking at K through 12 Mm. and allocating funds. There's a program right now that's put on by the Georgia um, Office of Innovation, I think. Uh, Office of Innovation, where you can actually take your tax credit that you earn from your production, apply it to this organization, and they will apply it to grants for K through 12 schools to build out these exact same things. So there are programs in place that, you know, may not be getting the correct amount or or the the best uh, publicity. But there are some programs in place where actually you can invest in those organizations and those programs and actually get your tax credit. Now, if people want to join the GPP. Yeah, you just go to georgiaproduction.org, click on the uh, the little button that says join and you you become a, a, a member and you become a part of this fight to keep this industry going. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. It's it's been amazing. It's good to see you again, um, and thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. We'll do it again. We should. <laughs> <laughs>